Okay, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Granner. Dr. Michael Granner is a licensed clinical psychologist certified in behavioral sleep medicine. He is director of the Sleep and Health Research Program and associate professor of psychiatry, psychology, medicine, nutritional sciences, and clinical translational science at the University of Arizona. His clinical work focuses on non-medication treatments for sleep disorders, and his research examines the relationship between sleep and obesity, diabetes, heart disease, daytime functioning, and longevity. He is the author or co-author of over 250 academic publications and is a frequent consultant and speaker on the issue of sleep health and has been invited multiple times to the US Congress to discuss the role of sleep in health and functioning. He is a fierce advocate for sleep disorder patients and for helping improve the patient experience. Welcome, Dr. Granner. Awesome. Thank you so much for, for having me here. I, I, um, as I say, every time I, I, I talk to a patient-led group, um, I will never say no to a patient group if they ask, if, if I physically can. Uh, because, I mean, that's, that's what I'm doing this for. Like, I don't, I don't care about keeping stuff in the lab. It's about actually helping actual people. Um, so today they asked me to talk about wearables, which is another hat I wear. Um, and so I've been working with sleep-related wearables for a long time. And so I figured, you know, with all this technology out there, how do you make use of it? So first I want, I want to give people a little bit of a crash course on sort of how these things work so that when you see your data in your app, you know how to interpret it and how not to interpret it. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about it. So first of all, why wearables? And, and this is an important question because now people sort of take this for granted, but like I used to have to write like whole paragraphs in my papers justifying the use of wearables in research because they're like, well, it's not polysomnography. And if it's not polysomnography, you're not measuring sleep. Sleep isn't a risk-based state last I checked. So why are you measuring it there? And the truth is, most people don't sleep in a sleep lab on a regular basis. Um, I don't. Uh, but, and even if they did, their sleep in the lab would be fundamentally different from how it is at home. And it depends on the question you're asking. I, I'm kind of a measurement nerd, and, and I'm very focused on what is your tool that you're using to measure, and what are you trying to actually measure? And if your question is wondering about how people sleep in the real world at home, that's where you should be measuring it. Okay, also in-lab sleep assessments don't account for things that are really important if you're looking at uh, changes in sleep over time, like night-to-night -night variability, weekends versus weekdays, all this sort of stuff you can't do with one night in the laboratory. So a little bit about the history. These things actually weren't invented very recently. The first devices used to estimate sleep-based, sleep-wake uh, um, trajectories outside of a lab were from the 60s and 70s. That's how old this technology is. That's actually why it's so reliable, because it's been vetted for a while. Um, at the first published study came out in 1972, and um, to make a long story short, the question was uh, an intern needed a project, and there was, a, there was a primate researcher on campus who had these devices that they put on monkeys as they jumped around and stuff, and they said, hmm, I need a project. Let me see if I throw a bunch of these things on some psych patients, on the psych psychiatric inpatients, and followed them around for a couple days. What would it show? That was it. Uh, that was the first study of actigraphy before it had a name. Um, but over time, this, this thinking evolved to be able to study all kinds of things. So a little bit about these devices and, and, and how they work. The foundation of how pretty much every wearable sensor is measuring sleep versus wake is a concept called piezoelectricity. Uh, piezoelectricity refers to the concept that certain solids, when you squeeze them, it changes their voltage output. Now, what the heck does that have to do with movement? I'm going to get to that in a second, but it's about the voltage output of squeezable solids. Usually they're crystals that occur naturally in nature, but you can manufacture them in the lab with certain ceramics. So if you squeeze these solids, it changes the voltage output. So that's it. So how does this, what does this relate to movement? So accelerometers came on the scene in like the 1980s. And what they did was, um, 
they allowed for, for pretty good precision. The first devices were super simple, but, but they allowed for some greater precision. And so this is essentially how an accelerometer works. So you have a mass, some sort of solid mass, over a piezoelectric material, and, and imagine them like this. And then you moved up, what would happen? The physics of it, you'd have inertia, and so the mass would squeeze the piezoelectric material as you moved it up briefly until it sort of adjusted and that would create the change in voltage. And you had the spring here that the amount that it distended or, 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 or squished would measure how much movement and how much acceleration there was. That's, that was why they were called accelerometers. And this, was the, this is like the 1980s version of what an accelerometer was. And the first device, like the device I used for my dissertation had 64 kilobits of memory and it was an analog device. This isn't digital, this is like an analog squeezing something. Um, they've gotten more complicated, um, but these were these were the original devices. Like so, they they put these images in their published papers from '72, um, and then '78 was the second one that came out, uh, and that was the first use of the word actigraphy, by the way. And they had a metal weight soldered on the end of an EEG pen wire that they stuck to this crystal. That, if I remember correctly, they got it out of one of those old telephones that had piezoelectric crystals in it, and they put that on a wrist-based thing. That was it. That was the first actigraph. Um, to this day, now we use things called microelectromechanical systems, which I can say slightly faster every time I say it. This is what's in your phone and in your Apple Watch and your Oura Ring or whatever. Um, it's nanotechnology applied to accelerometers, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, they're highly sensitive, super small, but essentially you have the same thing. You have a moving part, you have piezo, piezo resistors, you have um, I mean, it's just really, really, really tiny, but it's still a wiggling thing that is changing voltage. Um, and so that, that's, that, that's actually what they look like. <clears throat> so I was telling you that first, first study where they put them on a, on a handful of psych patients. So the reason I'm telling you this is, at the time, they didn't know what to do with this information. It's like, you know, just put this on psych patients. But what they found was, so this was an actual screenshot of the published papers from two of the patients. This is what they had. So if you look at this, well, what do you see? It's like, well, there's some peaks in the, later in the morning, and then there's a peak in the evening, and then it goes flat for a while. It's like, well, what can you make of this? Well, not much, except I know when they're sleeping, um, or at least in bed. Um, and, and thus the field was born out of these images of what the heck can we do with this data. Um, so if you're looking at a device, there's certain metrics we use. And the metrics that are important are not always the ones that people talk about. So this is what I want to educate you on a little bit. So there's three metrics we use for, for what we call epic by epic analysis. Just like, you know, PSG is in, in epics. Um, so when you compare it to a PSG as a gold standard, which is a different rabbit hole that I can talk about later, um, the metrics we talk about are sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. Sensitivity is of the times when the PSG said you were asleep, what proportion of those did the, did the device correctly identify sleep, assuming that the PSG was correct? Specificity is, of the total number of epics that the PSG identified as not sleep, what percentage of those did your device correctly identify as not sleep? Um, and accuracy is just what percent of them lined up. Um, and of these three, the most important is not accuracy. Accuracy is actually not very important at all. It's actually specificity that's the important one, and I'll tell you why. First of all, all these devices are essentially validated on people with relatively normal sleep. So when you take someone with relatively normal sleep and you put a, put a thing on them while they're in a PSG, because that's when you're validating this, they're usually, it's usually at night in bed. All right, so you take a person with relatively normal sleep, you put them to bed, what percentage of the time do they spend asleep? Like, let's say it takes them 20 minutes to fall asleep, they're awake for 20 minutes during the night, they spend 10 minutes in bed in the morning before getting up, you know, so they're getting 90 to 95% sleep efficiency. If you have a device that is a stopped clock and is a crappy device and, and it just overscores sleep like crazy and it says just everything is sleep. Jumping jacks, sleep. Everything is just sleep. You're gonna have 90 to 95% accuracy. Because if you look for sleep, where sleep probably is, you're likely going to find it. But that doesn't mean 
um, that you're a really good finder. It's just, if it's littered all over the place, oh look, I found one. It's like finding a ball in a ball pit. Um, it's all over, like, you know, finding a wristwatch in a ball pit, that's how you know you can search well. So it's looking for things that you don't expect to find in that field. That's why specificity is important because all of the algorithms are generally attuned to overscoring sleep because they're expecting to find it. And, and that's why specificity is the mark of a good device. Um, because most devices will have really high sensitivity. The, the commercial devices that are crappy, they're crappy because they say everything is sleep. Um, there, there's a few devices that are known to be better than others, um, but mostly when devices have problems, it's because they're overscoring sleep relative to PSG. Um, so, so Orfeo Buxton led this really awesome study of ACTA watches. So these are movement-only based devices, and this illustrates this concept really well. So the ACTA watch, how does the ACTA watch perform in a relatively normal sleeper sample? The blue is, so this is thousands of nights um, recorded from people. And each night had their own sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy. When you plot them out, what do you see? These devices are super sensitive. When they look for sleep, where sleep probably is, they find it a lot. They find almost all of the sleep. Um, and so accuracy is high. But it's the sense specificity where even an act to watch struggles. It's only detecting, what, 35, 40% of the wake epics that the PSG found. It's missing the majority of them. This is the limitations of the technology we have, that, that when you look at data from a wearable, whether it's sleep-wake detection, compared to a polysomnogram, it's going to overscore sleep. Now, the, the, the other side of this is, compared to a sleep diary, it's usually going to underscore sleep. When you ask people how much they slept, uh, they will remember more sleep than the device picks up. It's, the average is about 30, 40 minutes, which is fine because the device should be picking up lots of arousals during the night that humans have that we have no memory of. So the fact that, so I have to deal with this with, with people with their wearables all the time. Like, well, my watch only says I got six hours of sleep and that's low. It's like, well, if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines say seven hours by self-report specifically. I know, because I was on that committee and I wrote that section of the paper on purpose because people were gonna freak out about their wearables. We don't know what it translates to. And the reason it's self-report is for two reasons. Um, number one, this is why it's a pet peeve when people say objective is always better. We don't have the technology to measure sleep directly. Even polysomnograms are an indirect measure of sleep. They're just measuring certain kinds of activity on the outer layers of the cortex. And remember, sleep is like in the midbrain. It's really deep down in there. We're not measuring that. We're always estimating. And none of our estimates are perfect. And we don't have the technology to measure everything that sleep is, and so maybe the machines are missing stuff that, that our experience is actually capturing. Um, so that's why objective measures aren't necessarily better. Um, and the other reason why self-report was the, what's in the guidelines and recommendations, it's because that's where all the data was. When you have a survey of a million people, you can't do objective measures on all of them. Yet, we're getting there, but not there yet. So anyway, okay. So that's how you interpret the data. Like, if you're trying to interpret data relative to a polysomnogram, assume that, the, that any kind of wearable is underestimating uh, how much wake there was. But compared to your recollection, it might all be overestimating how much wake there was, which is correct. Who knows? It's just a different angle. Um, okay, since then we've added heart rate. So what does it mean to have a heart rate sensor? This is, all, this is from uh, photoplethysmography, which is another really long word that I can say slightly faster each time I say it and get used to it. Um, but the way this works, so if you have a device that has these little flashing lights, that's what this is. It's shining a light through your skin to your blood vessel and it's measuring the reflectivity of that light. And it's measuring that many times a second so that as, so the reflectivity, as your blood vessel does this, your reflectivity changes, like here, 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 and you can plot that out over time, and you get this, this pulse wave. And the reason, the way it measures heart rate is, even if the accuracy of the, the dynamics of that pulse wave isn't great, because it's just a sensor on your finger or your wrist or whatever, you're not like getting it here where you get a really good signal, um, or, or femoral or whatever, um, but at least you get where the peak is, and if you can find the peak, 
even if the shape of the wave isn't perfect, as long as you find the peak, you're good, because the peak-to-peak -peak interval is the same as the RR interval in, in your ECG. So at least you're getting heart rate. Even, and and notice, notice there's a little bit of a difference between where the electrical signal is and where the pulse wave is. Can, can, can anybody non-medical guess why there's that little bit of a different distance? Yes, yeah, the, the, the blood has to get there to, to the, where you measured it, from the heart. And so that's the speed that it, that, it, that it took to get there. That's why there's always that little bit of a delay. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's essentially how these devices are measuring your heart rate. It's shining a little light to measure the thing. So what's the difference between the wrist and the finger? So when you take someone's pulse, you usually don't do it on their finger, right? Or, or even the top of their wrist. You do the bottom of the wrist, you can get that, but you usually don't do top of the wrist. Those are bad places to get heart rate and pulse data, but that's what we got to work with. So is it good enough? Um, yes, it's good enough. Um, and what you can see here is look what happens, um, the wrist versus the finger. You get a lot of degradation of the signal at the finger. You can still get the rate just fine. It's just the shape of the wave is very different because um, it, it's degraded a lot by the time it gets all the way out here. Um, and so that's why like a finger, like ring devices, they can measure heart rate just fine as long as they can get a clean signal. Um, it's just the, the shape of the wave is very, be very different. So do the newer devices work relatively well? So this is a great study that compared, and here's a comparison between a Fitbit and an ActiWatch. Um, and you can see in terms of accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity, now you know what those mean, and now you know, like mostly just look at the green bar. I actually don't care too much about the other ones. And you can see that, that the people who say that the commercial devices are crap, and the, the, this whole thing of the scientific grade versus commercial grade, as if, it's, as if there's like one, one end is good and one end is bad, where you buy the thing is not correlated with how good it is. So like that's a different, like the, the measurement nerd in me is like, but those are two different variables. How are they at different ends of one spectrum? Um, there's no difference in quality between commercial grade and research grade devices in terms of their ability to detect sleep versus wake. It's not that the commercial ones are crappy toys and the scientific ones are, all of us are, are just that much better. They're, there's different benefits. Like you get the raw data and you can do all this other stuff with them. It's not that one's accurate and the other's not, actually. And if anything, the newer devices might be slightly better. So here's a bunch of other devices from a bunch of different studies of other commercial devices. The thing I'll, say, I'll tell you is, and I, was, I actually got permission from Fitbit Legal to publish this in one of our papers when we combined data from multiple Fitbit models. The algorithm is essentially the same across models. The sensors are essentially the same across models. You can kind of interchange them. They haven't really innovated on that because they think it's sort of fine anyway. So you can sort of pool Fitbit data across, mo across models and it's essentially identical. Um, so if you want to get a good Fitbit for measuring your sleep-wake, as long as it has movement and heart rate, it's essentially the same sleep-wake detection for whatever that's worth. Um, but if you look across devices, what you can see is, so this, this first one, that was the original Fitbit one, first original device that came out in 2009. Movement only, it was kind of crappy. Um, but since then, they got much better, a lot of the commercial devices. And, they're, they're, and so when people say, well, what's the best one? It's like, well, it's, more, it's not about the sleep-wake detection that differentiates the halfway decent ones. They're all a kind, they're kind of interchangeable. Depends on the study. You're gonna get between 40 and 60-ish percent specificity. That's kind of where you're at. Um, in terms of sleep staging, I have my own uh, bone to pick about like why do we care about sleep staging on wearables? Is it even remotely useful? Um, but people do it anyway, and why, you don't measure sleep stages at the wrist or the finger anyway, but could you theoretically with heart rate? Um, and, and this is the Fitbit data. This is what the Fitbit device does for measuring sleep stages. You can see how accurate it is right there. As you can see, it's okay. I mean, it's not gonna replace a lab anytime soon. But my favorite thing about the, this paper was that they actually published where all the errors were. So when I look at someone, or when you wanna look at your own data, and you see like, oh, I got X number minutes of deep sleep, or light sleep, or REM, or whatever, well, what percentage of that is likely correct? And what you can see here, like for example, look at deep. The device said, of the, of, of the column where it says, the, the, the Fitbit device said deep sleep. Well, most of it, the PSG agreed, but like a, big third of it, or a little more than a third, actually the PSG said that was light. Um, you're wrong. 
So like two thirds of the deep is probably correct. Um, when, when is it accidentally labeled as deep? Well, sometimes when the device said it was light, you know, 20,000 of the, of the records said it was light, about two and a half of them actually, the, the PSG actually said it was deep. You know, so 10% of the, of, of, the, of the amount of light sleep, about 10% of that is wrong, and it's probably deep, for example. Um, so yeah, this is where it makes mistakes. Light sleep is really hard to, to pin down, for example. You're gonna get a lot of it, but you're gonna miss, miss score some of it. It's not perfect. Um, it's still a pretty good ballpark. Um, and the, the, the Aura data validation paper showed this even better, where the same rate of agreement, Fitbit and Aura, they're about the same in terms of sleep staging, but the, this image tells that story really well, where here you have you know, 80 something percent agreement on sleep stages, so it's, a, it's ballpark correct. But if you look minute to minute, there's a significant number of minutes that differ between the two recordings, right? Uh, if you look like, well, this one says it's here and this one says it's there, but like if you look at these two side by side, this is the same person on the same night. It's not like random bad data. It's just, it's fuzzier and, and it smooths things out a little bit. But so it's like the number of minutes of whatever stage you get, I don't care. But, it's, but I look at the picture and see if the picture looks like it's supposed to or if there's anything weird in there that it can tell me about. It's not that if it shows like a bunch of deep sleep at the end of the night, does that mean you got a bunch of stage th N3 at the end of the night? No, it means the algorithm thought you did. Why? Was there something going, did you? Or was there something else going on at that time of the night, for example? That's how you look at this. You, you don't throw it out as much as other people in the sleep world just throw out all the sleep staging data. Um, publishing on it has been, has been miserable. Everyone just rejects it because they're like, this is all crap. It's not all crap, it's just, it's not perfect either. Um, it's, I think, a good general descriptor. A little bit about the Apple Watch. Unlike the other devices, you have to download separate apps to do stuff on Apple Watch, so each app could have its own algorithms and they would need to be independently tested and no one's ever really done that. Uh, but the mission group um, has done a really good job with their own homegrown Apple Watch algorithms to show what the device does. And I love this one because it tells a really cool story. So, for people not familiar with ROC curves, you wanna get this like, you wanna saturate the, the curve as, as high as possible to like near 100% sort of accuracy. And so what it's saying is, on the left is, move, is sleep versus wake determination, on the right is sleep staging. And it's like if you have movement in your model, heart rate in your model, or combined in your model, like who's, you know, how accurate are you? And then they added this thing called clock proxy, which is they just put the time of day in because whether you're in the beginning of the night or the end of the night, that might actually be an important determinant of, of whether you're awake or asleep. And what you can see here is on the left, um, heart rate is kind of crappy at telling sleep versus wake alone. Uh, movement is doing all the heavy lifting on sleep versus wake and gets slightly better when you add heart rate. But almost all, so like if you've got movement data, you've got sleep versus wake. For sleep staging, movement takes you, does really well and then totally falls off a cliff. And that's because you can't use movement, you can use movement alone to tell whether you're like restless or not, but not what sleep stage you're in. Um, and notice heart rate alone is, is terrible, but when you combine the two, that's where you get the good sleep, uh, sleep staging estimation. It's really, you need both. If you've got just movement and they're trying to guess whether you're in light or deep sleep, crap, it doesn't work. But if you've just got heart rate, they can't tell if you're in light or deep sleep. You need to have both movement and heart rate, apparently. Um, a little bit about Whoop on here, only because it's another very commonly used device. It seems to be kind of in the same range as all the other. The, the, so the thing is, all of these devices, however they get their signal, they're translating it into a movement signal and a heart rate signal. Once you have movement and heart rate, the, the algorithms are pretty much interchangeable across the devices. That's why the accuracy is pretty much interchangeable across devices. Um, so this is data we published on, on a different device called the, the Happy Ring, and the, the thing about it that was different was um, they weren't sleep people when they developed this, and they said, why are all your algorithms the same? And from the 80s, can't we do better? Um, and so they came up with the idea of why should the algorithm be the same across the entire night and for everybody identically? People sleep differently. So they came up with an algorithm that modifies itself. Um, and so when you applied it, you could see the specificity shot way up. Like, you see, notice, I don't even care about the other bars. I don't care. I'm looking at specificity. The specificity shot way up, which means it was better able to detect the wake episodes. Sleep staging data um, was the same. 
essentially, because clearly that didn't help with the sleep staging data, but it helped with the sleep-wake detection. So sleep staging data across all these devices in our study also was eh, pretty much interchangeable. Um, then there's these nearables instead of wearables. Um, the thing is, as fancy as all this technology is, like the radar and the cardioballistics and all this stuff, they're really just turn, it's movement and heart rate. Right? I mean, think about it. Like, even the radar is getting how much you're moving and heart rate. There may be some respiration stuff in there, too. But as soon as you get a movement and heart rate signal, that's why the validation data are like the same. The number, those numbers should look very familiar. High sensitivity, 40 to 50% specificity on a good device, you know, getting you 85, 90% accuracy. Doesn't matter whether it's radar or RF or, or a mat under your bed or the mattress itself, whatever it is, you, as long as you're translating it to a movement and heart rate signal and you're not doing anything us unusual with your algorithm, these are the numbers you're probably gonna get. So when people say like, what's the best device? That's why I say like, eh, it's not about accuracy, which is the best device. It's about like, what's best for your situation and what else does it do or does it not do? Um, yeah, so now they're putting this stuff actually in the beds. And so your bed may, may you might not even need these things in the future. Um, how do these devices do for daytime sleep? Not too bad if you look for daytime sleep with them. Um, not quite as good as nighttime sleep. So this was, this was a great study um, in looking at and shift workers. Um, looking at uh, shift work sleep during the day versus shift uh, unplanned versus planned. Um, things like that, where it's it's not quite as good, but it still was okay. Um, how does it work in hypersomnia disorders? There isn't much, uh, but I did find a, a really well done study that showed that um, actually it was better for idiopathic hypersomnia than narcolepsy, um, but still it wasn't too bad um, for for even for narcolepsy, where um, total sleep time, sleep efficiency, and sleep latency were pretty okay. Um, the sleep efficiency wasn't was was on average five percent off. Um, on average, total sleep time was twenty something minutes off. So it wasn't it wasn't awesome, but it wasn't terrible. And for idiopathic hypersomnia, actually looked it was looked like it was right on. Um, looked like it was pretty good. Um, this is our poster that we're presenting this week, where we used uh, it was actually the happy ring that we used. Uh, because they had such high specificity, I'm like, wow, you can detect sleep and wake maybe where it doesn't belong. Let's see if we can use this in hypersomnia disorders to catch sleepiness during the day. So we're starting this process by validating against an MSLT. Um, and so here's the data we're going to be presenting, where out of 50 MSLTs, just the ring um, identified 90% of them correctly in, in the first version of the algorithm. And you could see the distribution of... Um, of uh, differences. So this, so this is the difference between two human scores and the difference between um, the ring and the human score. So the ring and one score versus the other human score and the one score, which is the, the problem with, of validating these things against PSG is humans don't agree. So how do you, ma how do you hit a moving target? Or when the, there's two targets, how do you hit both of them simultaneously? You can't. When you have two human raiders and they're not totally agreeing, like you can't, um, you, you can't hit that target. So, so, th so this is why we looked at it this way of like, well, is the deviation between the device and the, uh, and the score the same as if a, a difference between a human and the score? And it looks like, yeah, it's about the same. So it looks like it's very promising, um, but obviously this is all unpublished still and, and our posters and the post trial at sleep. Um, so this is why sleep staging data is, I think, not really what we should care about out of these devices because um, you're gonna get a limit of how good it's gonna be because what is sleep? Sleep is all kinds of stuff. A subset of what sleep is is in the brain. A subset of what sleep does in the brain is in the cortex. A small subset of what's in the cortex is what's actually picked up by the EEG. Then that goes through processing and measurement error and sampling over time where you're missing things and then gets in the software and then you have a human who says, well, that's, that's uh, stage two. Mm, nope, no, I was wrong, stage one. Like that's how, you, that's how you get a sleep stage. 
okay, so how do you replicate that using heart rate? Well, a subset of what sleep is is also in the periphery. A subset of that is in the heart. A subset of that will be reflected in the heart rate. And a subset of that might show up on a PPG signal, which then also gets processed. And then you come up with an algorithm that tries to guess what a human would do when it does this and looks at those same numbers. And it agrees some of the time. So like you've got two games of telephone going in opposite directions and using the result of one to guess the result of the other one. And the fact that they're aligned with each other means you've got a really, really stable game of telephone. But like they're not going to be perfect. They're never going to be perfect, um, except by coincidence. And so I would say, like, stop looking at that. Like, look for, like, the rhythms and the heart rate. That's what I would say. I do want to mention that there's skin types that are different or heart rate. When you're shining a light through, through something and measuring its reflectance, the physics of light, there are two elements of the skin that can change that. Um, when light passes through materials, um, one is how thick is it? And number two, how much does that... What color is it? Does it absorb frequencies of light or reflect them better? And what you can see is that skin tone um, and obesity both change the interpretability of these data. Um, and so this was a great paper that looked at, um, uh, at different, ver different combinations of obesity and skin tone showing that, that the most obese, darkest skin tone versus the least obese, lightest skin tone, you have different distributions of accuracy on some of these devices. I just wanted to put this up there to know like, just because it's technology and it's fancy and it's expensive and you get lots of numbers and it uses lasers and things, doesn't mean it's not imperfect. Again, when you're looking at wearable data, everything is through this lens of, of approximation and a guess. And, and you don't overinterpret it. But the real problem for technology, and I apologize if you've seen this slide, I put it in every wearables talk I do because I'm a behavior person, not an engineer. What is this? What is this? A bathroom scale. What does it do? It measures your weight. It gives you a number. Okay. What is this? This is also a bathroom scale, but it has an app. And it has you other numbers on there too. But still just a bathroom scale. Um, it just measures stuff. Just because it's fancy and has an app doesn't mean it does anything different. And, and um, so I have a colleague, Amy Athey, who likes to say a bathroom scale is not a weight loss program. Um, <laughs> and that's the difference between measurement technology and interventions. I have, there's so many people who are like, well, which device is gonna help me sleep better? Like, which bathroom scale is going to help you lose weight better? Like, that's not the point. They're just measurement tools to help you. And, and, and a lot of these companies sell feedback as intervention. I mean, if telling people stuff were interventions, like nobody would smoke and everyone would eat five to seven servings of vegetables every day. Like, it doesn't work that way. Um, and then I want to end with this idea of, of AI. Like, all kinds of stuff is going to happen. Algorithms are going to be changing. Devices are going to be changing. Um, how people get feedback on their information is going to be changing. How correct is it going to be? Um, and, and so, like, who knows where, where this is going to go. Um, I like asking ChatGPT to write haikus. I find that funny. Um, but anyway, so thank you very much, and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, questions for Dr. Grana? Which device is the best? <laughs> but which one should I buy? Um, uh, first of all, as a tech nerd, I, I like very cynical takes on tech. Um, <laughs> it's because you know, you know yeah, how. I know. Yeah, I know, yeah, I won't get into it right now, but, um, <laughs> what would you like to see just kind of, you know, pie in the sky wish list of, um, like at home wearable, uh, for like, what would the perfect device, like technology aside, be? Like what would it do and how? Yeah, I think ideally, my, my vision for sleep technology is to get it as out of the way as possible. The more passive you can make it, um, the more, and the more sources of information you can include in your decision-making algorithm, the more useful that information can be. And I didn't say accurate, 
um, because I don't care about accuracy, because accuracy relative to what? It's like a sleep diary is extremely accurate to what a sleep diary measures and is way more useful for insomnia than any wearable ever will be, or at least to in the foreseeable future. So it's not about accuracy. Everyone fixates on that, but it's about how useful is the information to make choices and decisions. And I think that my vision is we're going to start instead of focusing on one metric or one device, we're gonna start looking at the ecosystem of devices and, and learning what, how to best use that information to make people's lives better, um, whether it's um, using your ecosystem of Internet of Things to, to know when to start like cooling your home at night to anticipate when you're going to want to go to sleep versus, you know, like, and, and some of you in the room I've talked about this, like I have this crazy idea about like what if wearables could detect daytime sleepiness before you even know what the hypersomnia disorders even exist because your doctor certainly doesn't either. And so what if you're like just how like, you know, my Apple Watch is constantly looking for AFib, which I don't have, um, but it's constantly looking for it. And if, if my heart rate would, were going to be a little wacky, it's going to say, hey, did you know what AFib is? We just kind of looked for that and found it. Um, you should go to your doctor, and this is what you should tell them. Um, it got FDA approved for doing that. What if these devices could just passively be looking for sleep disorders that people don't even know that they have, but it's watching you every night? It can tell. Um, and more better than your doctor can or one night in a lab can eventually because it's knowing your patterns. And what it, that, that's my vision from a sleep disorders perspective for wearables, that I, can, that I can tell you things that you didn't even realize were important, but it was looking for them. Have you looked at uh, the devices I bought one years ago and it's packed away somewhere? Um, but the, with the headband, yeah, and so I think it measured at the forehead? Yeah, so there's some, that, that's a new world of wearables is EEG devices. So there was Dream, which is now not Dream or something. Um, the sleep Profiler is a little more clinical. There's Cerebra. Muse is finally getting into the game of actually having scientifically validated headband devices that are less expensive. I mean, as you know, technology gets cheaper and smaller, we can measure sleep at the level of the EEG. And, and that's a whole other stream of information about sleep. Um, is it inherently better? I can get, I can, that'll be a fun lunch pro con debate at the sleep meeting whether an EEG wearable is better than a different kind of wearable because I, I suspect most of the polysomnography based sleep physicians would say, well, of course it is. And I would say, well, eh, maybe not. Um, it's just a different piece of data that measures sleep in a different way. That, and, and, and I'm a big believer in the more angles you look at something, the more a complete picture you have, especially if all of the angles are indirect. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's super cool. I mean, I'm trying, we, we have a couple studies where we've used them. Um, we have studies coming up where we're trying to play around with different ones of these. So I, I think you're right. I think wearables are also on the forehead. Though most people are probably not gonna walk around with these all day. Um, where like this, you can, this is a little more inconspicuous, but theoretically you could, yeah. Wackiest wearable question. I'd throw it at me. I will. I've seen them all. So for the Whoop specifically, I'm not yeah. sure on the other ones. It has like a recovery score. Oh, I'm so glad you asked about that. And it, you know, it's mostly based on heart rate variability. Yes. It'll throw in your sleep and maybe some other stuff, and it tries like to other produce stuff like insights. nonsense. Yes. Right, and I would love to know, what are the limitations of right. this recovery score, especially for people with sleep disorders? Right, I would ignore them. Um, <laughs> so, okay, if, if I were, I, what I'm supposed to say is that they're total nonsense because they're just made up uh, with no validation data, but they were mostly made up by not idiots either. Um, there are people who know kind of how heart rate works, and like if I've got a patient, who's like, you know what, I feel like I'm sleeping and I just feel like crap during the day and I don't have sleep apnea. So I'm like, yeah, show me your device. Let me check out your heart rate tracing across the night. And if it's like, if it's staying high or if it's maybe dropping, but it's starting really high, so you're spending most of the night above resting, or it's like going up during the night a bunch of times. I'm like, yeah, you, this, is, this is some signal that something's going on in your body that you're reacting to. Maybe it's alcohol that kept it high in the beginning of the night or whatever, or maybe it's some autoimmune thing. But like it's a pretty good indicator, I think, of like whether you're sleep of sleep crappiness. 
Um, that, that general sleep quality seems to correlate better with like wacky heart rate stuff that we don't quite yet have good measures for, which is why we need to be looking at that instead of sleep stages out of heart rate, and rather than just sleep wake. There's something really important in there, and I think those people are correct, but no one's really validated any of these metrics. So, they're, so in my mind, they're, from a scientific perspective, they're just made up, and I don't know how to interpret the numbers. I don't know where, like with the sleep stages data, because that's published, I know where they're strong and where they're weak. So when I look at the numbers, I know how much fuzziness to project onto it. With the recovery scores, I don't. So, and if you have a sleep disorder, I, I can promise you that nobody in their sample had hypersomnia disorders especially. I mean, it was mostly younger adult male engineering students or, or, or you know, that's who they're building these things around and athletes. So like, how do you interpret those data? I have no idea. So I mostly ignore it, to be honest. Unless I see it in the context of all the other numbers, like is it, is it consistent or is there something inconsistent about it? Um, so like, I don't mean to throw them under the bus, but like some of the, so like when you, sleep-wake data, I trust the most. Sleeps, the heart rate data, I trust, because I know those devices are good. The sleep staging data, I take as a ballpark. Heart rate variability, I take as a ballpark. The readiness recovery stuff, I take as like a wild shot in the dark. Like maybe it hits, but maybe it doesn't. So anyway, thank you so much for asking that question because people worry about those numbers. Thank you. All right. Thank you.